and Jamie Lee Curtis and Raquel Welch's kids. I mean, I could go on and on. I am not Mr. Lebowski. I'm the dude. Hi, folks. This is Brian Lally here, and you're about to watch an episode of Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. So in case you don't know the show, it's Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. Here with my partner in crime, Scott Williams. Scott, who do we have on the show today? Today, Brian, we have a lovely guest, Pamela Dillman. Wonderful artist who has a lifetime of stories about her art. Starting out with being the daughter of a Broadway star turned Hollywood movie star. Her stepmother, Susie Parker, was the top model in the world, and she is the first supermodel turned actress. Pamela's story takes us from Los Angeles to New York to London to New York and back to Los Angeles. Pamela's twins are making a name for themselves in the world of volleyball. Her daughter is an amazing artist who is featuring her talents through dance. Pamela herself has just been nominated for an audio award. Catherine Hastings, the author of the book, which Pamela narrated, says that the audio awards are the equivalent to the Oscars. Stick around. You, oh, and I almost forgot now, like I forgot during the podcast, Pamela was on an episode of Seinfeld that voted the greatest sitcom in history. And me, Mr. Interviewer, forgot to bring that up. But there you have it. So, folks, enjoy Pamela Dillman. I like that photo. Look at that. This is called Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. That is my junior year Hollywood High yearbook picture. And I don't have a senior year because I didn't graduate. <laughs> so Pamela wanted to do a scene with me from a, a play, and she gave it to me. She said, Brian, be Lally, you are... Uh, you're perfect for this. I want to do this scene with you. And I said, great. And I, I read the part, and it turned out that uh, the man, the character I was playing, was a, a bisexual pornographer. And, 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 How is it I have no memory of this? Well, and we did it on scene night. It went well. It went well. It, the fact was, I didn't do any bisexual pornography <laughs> <laughs> on the school stage that night. What but it that's work. what it was about. So last week, I get an audition for a pedophile rapist, kidnapper, torturer. And my agent sends me an email that says, we did not submit you for this. Casting called for you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Maybe they'd come to that scene night. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Pamela gave them a recommendation. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. It's a second lead in the film. A wow. small film, but it's uh, awesome. interesting as fuck. Awesome. So there's some shit that goes down. And and you know what? Not all of it for me. So, all right. You know. To be continued. Yeah. So we got that going on. I got that going for me, which is nice. <laughs> so where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles at the old Beverly Hills Doctor's Hospital, which does not exist anymore. It's on. It was, used to be on the corner of... Beverly, Glen, and Wilshire Boulevard. Beverly, Glen, and Wilshire? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where Donald Sterling bought up the whole neighborhood and built the high rises. I didn't know there. There was... you go. And where Ernie Kovacs died in a really? fatal car crash. And I know this because my best friend through all, throughout all of elementary school was Ernie Kovacs' daughter, Mia. Oh, wow. Yeah. I had no idea. You know, yeah. I like to know everything about L.A. Yeah. It, what corner? Do you remember what it, corner? It was, was right it? in front of the Beverly Hills Doctor's Hospital as I No, heard. no, no. Oh. I mean, the hospital was yeah, on I, the Northwest. Okay, because there's an old yeah. synagogue that's yeah. been there forever yeah. and a couple of the older high-rises, but yeah. the uh, Wilshire Corridor. Yeah. I had a girlfriend who lived just west of there, you know, a little two-story cute little apartment building that's now 30-story yeah. condo complex yeah, selling yeah. for... $10 million penthouses or something. Yeah, yeah. So I had no idea. That's awesome. Yeah. So your folks were in town at they the time? They were living in L.A. at that time. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was under contract still for 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. but was still, it was at the tail end of the contract days. Right. Then within another year and a half or so, my parents had divorced. My dad 
um, met Susie Parker and they bought a house as well in Beverly Hills. We had been living in Rustic Canyon, which is a fantastic area. To sure. Be yeah. Um, so that was my childhood home right. in Rustic Canyon. I actually went to preschool at the Canyon oh. School and then elementary school at John Thomas Dye in Bel Air. Oh, wow. And, Look um, at you. I know. Fancy. It still is a yeah. very fancy school. Yeah. <laughs> it was always very celebrity heavy. As a matter of fact, we were the celebrity poor folk by yeah. far. Right. I mean, when I was at John Thomas Dye, it was the Douglas Boys and Jamie Lee Curtis and... Raquel Welch's kids. I mean, I could go on and on. It right. was the, the Reagan kids were there. Right. So we were just, yeah. We got we in. We were just we, from the wrong we, side we of the tracks. We just barely slid in. <laughs> what are you doing with the Dillman right. girl? She's from the wrong side of the <laughs> right. tracks in Bel Air. Right. And then Dad and Susie um, bought a house in Santa Barbara, so I started to divide my time between the two. Was that the Montecito place? That's I the mean, Montecito okay. place that that, that I uh, went to. That you've been to, and yeah. recently just resold, and was on very heavily advertised on the market as Susie Parker's estate, which oh, had, wow. would have made my dad laugh. What can I say? He bought it for eighty thousand dollars cash in nineteen sixty nine, wow. and it just sold as Susie Parker's estate for twenty million. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's the way things go. Susie Parker, uh, for people who don't know, the yes. first supermodel turned actress? Well, there are yes. a lot who lay claim to oh. the title of first supermodel, but the reason that Susie legitimately can own that is mm -hmm. that before the term was really coined, she was the first model to have made as much money as she did and to have become in a household name right because models before Susie really were were not known by name right they were known by images right. her sister dorian lee had been very famous and continued to be for a while after Susie's rise she was the revlon fire and ice model okay and she brought Susie with her on a photo shoot with richard avedon one day just because she had to babysit Susie, who was 10 years younger than dorian right and avedon looked at then 13 year old Susie and said can i please photograph her. And for a little while, they all worked together and were friends, but Susie went in a different direction and um, in, in her in her modeling career, she became Avedon's favorite model. Wow. And Dorian ended up working more in Europe and arguably they were both just some of the most beautiful women in the world. Well, well, well actually, uh, uh, Christian Dior called Susie the most beautiful woman in the world. Wow. And during her day, wow. late, late 50s, early 60s, she was. <laughs> So, yeah, she can own that first supermodel title. <laughs> I'm like a fan of the bleachers across from the Oscars right now. Uh, wow. Uh, wow. Was there jealousy between the two when that started? Oh, that's a really, really good question. And, of course, yes is the answer. And, and it's a really fascinating story. The, the relationship between Susie Parker, Dorian Lee, and Richard Avedon really should be a movie or a TV series. Uh -huh. I, I would love to pitch this idea to somebody who could really know what to do with it because you're, it, it, it's fascinating and fabulous. Wow. And so beautiful an era. It already conjures up such beautiful images of the style and, and uh, grace that they all inhabited with a lot of fiery tempestuousness behind the scenes. So yes, they had a very, very tempestuous relationship, Dorian and Susie. They had great fallings out over the years and then great emotional coming back together. And... Um, uh, when Susie passed away in 2003, wow, way was too it young. almost 20 years yeah, ago? Only, yeah, Jeez. but she was only 70 when she passed away. And I was with my father when he phoned Dorian, who was then living in Paris, to give her the news. And I could hear the screams from across the kitchen with Dorian's just wailing at the news. So they had, they had, lo they loved each other deeply, even though they were so. Um, yeah, yeah, competitive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to take this story to my friend Dalton. Dal you Dalton, Nick, you ready for this one? <laughs> so they're doing quite well over at Creative Artists Writing Things right All now. Right. I believe they're going to be household names any day now. They're, awesome. they're not only the greatest people in the world, they're very, very talented. So I believe that. Uh, we'll talk about this. All right. I don't know.
That's fantastic. So you were going back and forth between the homes? So, so I mean, your father and yes. Susie were also traveling back and forth? No, or? no. Once they bought the house in Santa Barbara, they were Susie really retired from her work, and she dedicated herself to full-time momhood wow. um, with a passion. Mm-hmm. And my mother continued to stay in Los Angeles right. and remarried. Mm-hmm. And then I divided my growing up years between the two households. But dad would travel from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles right. every week for work. In that same Montecito house that had the yellow kitchen tile, was that Oh, the? yes, the yellow and I'm blue. colorblind, yes, so I was taking a stab in the dark. Yes, Might that's have been green. right. It was a, so. it, the kitchen was where it all happened, the center of all activity. <laughs> So when did you go to New York? Because you, where did you start acting? Did you start acting here or did you start when you were in New York? And how old were you? I wanted to be an actress from my earliest memory, even I, before I knew that that was what my father did. I've had a few people in here yeah. say the same thing. Yeah. And I always go to Pacino because his book, you know, Life on the Wire talks about that mm-hmm. when he was like six. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. You know, I was stifled from it. I didn't start until I was 30. I know that so, about you. Yeah, but anyway, but I love that. I love that people knew at that age and you were encouraged to do it? Or? Because I came from a, a family of, of artists. It, it was not, which is, you know, to, absolutely to their credit because in that day it was still not considered 100% the best thing to be supporting right. a child who wanted to pursue that. And I have to say also, my dad wasn't 100% behind the decision. He didn't tell me, no, I couldn't do it. But um, he also was very aware that pr- particularly for a woman and a woman who who is going to be in a category of a certain leading lady, ingenue into leading lady, it's much more difficult. It's, he, he was always very vocal about the fact that it's harder for women in the industry, which is still true, and it's even harder for women who are going to compete for in that range. It's better to go into a, a character field. You'll just have more work. You'll work longer. Right, right. But, of course, we always think that we'll be the exception. But, and so, but had you wanted to play for the 49ers? They, well, this would have been uh, highly... <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a lifelong San Francisco 49er, not just fan. No. I, I digress here, but he was an unofficial scout for the right. 49ers. Right, a he consultant? Was so, uh, yes. Yeah. He became personal friends with right. Bill Walsh and DeBartolo, and he was invited to the draft. He was I actually know. extremely knowledge, yeah. knowledgeable yeah. About, yes. about football. I talked so, yeah. to him a little bit about it that time yeah. in his study. Yeah. He sat in that tall chair with the oh, tall yeah. desk and... I was still intimidated. Your father was very, very nice to me all the time and very complimentary, but we'll get to that later. Do you think that's why I did a project uh, about five years ago with Dean Miller, who's Roger Miller's son, and he talked about when he was young writing songs that Roger would critique him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to say sternly. He'd give him a real critique, and he said, Mm -hmm. I can't. I can't say everything's okay, I'm paraphrasing. can't say it's all good because then you'll get out of here thinking that it is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Dean is extremely talented producer, writer, musician, singer. But do you think that's why your father was harsh with you? Yeah, I think partly, you know, he, even though he was supportive, because his parents had not been supportive of right. his pursuit of the business. When Where he, was he born? San Francisco. Oh, okay. And his father was from a, you know, financial um, investment. His mother was from um, a, um, a, a wealthy, um, you know, California aristocracy sort of background. They right. thought that his pursuit of an acting career was just no, disastrous. Yeah. yeah. They just did not support it at all. Right. So, and then, of course, he went on to become very successful, and they could still, when... When when they would you know when he was a young actor they would still introduce him to their friends as as uh, as as Brad Dillman um, uh, who who who's an actor but they would also say but he was a Marine as well you know they had to they had to uh, they had to give know, him something legitimate had to give him something legitimate yeah. to be proud yeah um, and Dad was he was very, more very, likely very to step on a landmine yes. than uh, you know do Shakespeare so <laughs> he was a Marine thank God so well, I didn't know so how how 
exciting was was him uh, was it for him to be in all the Dirty Harry movies in San Francisco? Oh yeah, he enjoyed that a lot. He yeah. did. He enjoyed that a lot, yeah. and he loved working with Clint Eastwood. They were good pals during those years. They were working together. And a good friend of my father's, John Larch. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. I remember when I uh, started uh, acting, wanted to act, and oh. John can be very intimidating. I, I, I think it was tongue in cheek. Maybe it wasn't. I heard you're getting in the business. <laughs> yes, sir. I was a grown man. John was a big dude. He was a uh, intim. Well, he was the John Larch was the father in the uh, Wish It Into the Cornfield Twilight Zone. Oh, with Billy Mummy in the. Uh, oh, with Billy yeah. Mummy. He's a bad man. Oh, He's a bad sure. man. Wish It Into the Cornfield, son. Wishing that was John Larch played the dad. But anyway, so that's that's great. I didn't put two and two together. So he got to be in his hometown making. He did. Really big movies. Dad was very fortunate in that from the time he went to New York, after after he was, um, you know, he served in the Korean War. Right. And then when he came back and he'd gone to Yale and um, he spent, you know. Did maybe, he study acting with the. Back then it wasn't Yale drama school. Oh. He went to Yale and he majored in, in English lit. Yeah. But he was acting while he was at Yale, but not professionally yet. He would do Summer Stock Theater in New York, which is mm -hmm. where he met my mother in oh, Sharon, okay. Connecticut, at the okay. Sharon Playhouse. Right. But he spent about a year what he called pounding the pavements in New York, where he was, you know, working hard to try to get jobs. He wrote a book all about this. It's hilarious. It's called Are You Anybody? And right, right, really, right. Really the, yeah, I went so to the... talk a lot, a lot about that. Sure, I went to the... Um... The signing at Samuel French, oh, there was good. a line of people out the door. You don't remember the story? Yeah. I walked in and your dad stopped the signing. He said, hold on, everybody, hold on. Brian Lally, very talented. And he stood up oh. and clapped. And I'm like, good. Mr. Dillman, I was so humbled. And he was so, so kind to me. Oh, line of people oh, out the door oh, getting his book signed. And he, he did when we were doing, obviously, we were doing the baby, the baby dance, dance. And he came and saw it. And. I mean, what? I mean, please, you know, <laughs> I was, uh, I wasn't a kid, but I hadn't been acting that long. And it was just, and I, I know all, you know, all his work. And of course, we're going to get to the story of that, you know, my favorite Eugene O'Neill play is Long Day's Journey into Night. And he was handpicked by Carlotta. You've told he me the story. Serious. I'm going to have you tell it again <laughs> to play to. the Eugene O'Neill part in, in, in the Broadway production. Yeah. Okay, so you were telling that. So that was before Bobby Lewis was teaching there. It was a yes. generation before. Yes, okay. it was. It was. So, so when he went to New York, he was starting from scratch, right. and he did some live TV. He mm -hmm. was started to work. Um, he was studying at the Actors Studio. Right. And Bobby Lewis was still there at the time. I'm guessing before uh, he went to. I honestly Yale. don't. Know. Okay. Okay. I honestly don't know. Right. I just love Bobby um, Lewis. Yeah, He's yeah, just yeah, a yeah, great. Yeah. He's great. I agree. So Long Day's Journey was literally his big break. I mean, he right. went from being a nobody to starring in in that play. And, right. and so he was, of course, a very gifted actor with my father. He was also incredibly fortunate to have that mm -hmm. opportunity. And it was just a God touch all the way around. So... So um, I could talk for hours about my father's career, and maybe, maybe, maybe that's what exactly what we should do. But I want to circle it back around to say that that is why he could be supportive of my choice, even though at heart he didn't really want it for me because he knew it was going to be hard and even harder than it was for him, mm -hmm. which it was. So anyway, that's a long way around saying why I ended up in New York at the time I did. And uh, should I talk about that or should I go back and circle well, back I, about I my dad I want you to first. tell the Let's story about, about him first. going up to meet yeah. Carlotta. Yeah. Well, so my dad, who was not supported in his acting endeavors by his parents, by this time had been married to my mother, right? Or at least he had met. They were engaged. So they were living um, in, you know, hell, what was then Hell's Kitchen in New York, which really was. I mean, there was a reason it was called Hell's Kitchen. Because it was full uh, of yeah. the Irish. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> I have family from there, so don't. <laughs> Hell's Kitchen in the Bronx, so. Well, it was a very, always a colorful place. But now, now you don't really see see what it was no yeah yeah oh, now no. it's perfectly nice yeah. yeah yeah so and his roommate was jack knowles um who wrote a separate piece john john knowles and uh, he was literally typing away on his old manual typewriter writing that manuscript while he and dad were roommates and dad wow. was pounding the pavement wow. and he had an opportunity to audition for um the uh, for Long Day's Journey into Night, 
O'Neill had passed away. Um, so this was a posthumous production, and his widow was the one who was making the final casting decisions because it was very important to her that not only that her husband's vision um, would be fulfilled, but that this pivotal role, which was really um, a very autobiographical role for O'Neill, was um, was played by somebody appropriate mm -hmm. that she could see playing her Jean. Uh, playing yeah. Eugene. And so dad was so nervous when he got this opportunity that he went out and had a drink before the audition, which was held at her apartment. He had auditioned, you know, he made it right. past the original, you know, casting right. calls to this was the sort of the final round. It was, she, he was invited to her apartment and in New Jose, York. Uh, Jose Quintero, Quintero was the director. Right. And so what one drink, and dad was not a heavy drinker at, at this time and never really, um, but he had more than one drink because he was so nervous. And um, so as he recalls, he stumbled his way through that meeting. And in the end, it was really what got him the job. This is terrible. This is, this, is, this is not an endorsement of doing such a thing. But he had to laugh and acknowledge that it was the very fa fact that he had obviously been slightly snockered in that <laughs> meeting that clinched it because it reminded Carlotta so much of Eugene. And she said, he's just like my Gene. Man, Brian. You know what I love doing? Yeah. I love tapping that subscribe button. Mmm. I love it too, son. And just like all your dates, I tap it last. But nothing's as good as tapping this button. You see Brian here? He's not always doing the best. Financially, mentally, physically, for sure. You want to help keep Brian off the streets of Hollywood? There's a way you can help. Join us on Patreon. You want to tell them what we got on there, buddy? Yes, we have the general admission, we have the backstage, and we have the VIP all-access pass. So please, join today. I'm due for a bath. In the arms of <laughs> the angel, just like my gene, that boy. <laughs> oh, that was unbelievable. Oh, Do you oh. know? I'm just curious. You know how long the run was? Well, Dad was only in the run for the first year because yeah. he was contracted by 20th Century Fox, right. okay. and it was a, it was he was very conflicted over this. Well, especially back then. I mean, Broadway for an actor, yeah. an O'Neill part. I mean, yeah, for two reasons, he accepted the Fox contract. One was the money. Right. He was married by this time. His wife was pregnant. Um, that was a big draw. Right. But also, it was brutally hard to do that play night after sure. night after night. I it had was... actually asked him about that. Yeah. 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 He just said it was extremely difficult to do it correctly. Yeah. 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 And it was Dean Stockwell, I think, who took over when Dad left. And oh. then, interestingly, Stockwell and Dad, of course, worked together in Compulsion not too long after. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. And I think Stockwell did the movie. He did the version. movie. Yeah. Yeah. With Jason Robards. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And, oh, uh, Dad has what had wonderful stories about Jason Robards. Yeah. Who, before the kind of acting we were trained in, right. you and I, had become something that one could label so specifically. Right. He was instinctively that kind of actor. Right, right. And those are the ones like, you know, Richard Burton and, um, you know, Peter O'Toole, those yes. people from back then that, that were instinctually Instinct like that. Exactly. Plus the training, the technical training. There were some that just happened to be like that. Well, and... And to have worked with Frederick March and Florence Eldridge at the same time, who we right. were much more old school, right. but sure. equally powerful. Sure. I mean, the stage was just... Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the stories Dad has about Long Day's Journey, specifically the one I'm sure I've told you about, Helen Keller being in the audience, right. are just... I mean, it's incredible. People who happened to have seen that production still will say it was yeah. the most powerful theatrical experience yeah. in, of their lives. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. So yeah. 
And did you start training as a child there, or how so, did you? So w once I was firm with my folks that I really wanted to be an actress, they, you know, allowed and humored that. They insisted that I take piano lessons in case I needed to fall back on something. I could be an accompanist. They insisted I, right. which I never got good w enough to were do. Were you no, dancing ballet I was dancing, at that time? I was taking classical ballet. I was studying secretarial skills. I had to, I have to have, one has to have things to fall back. Huh. How and is your shorthand? I'm just... It's actually really good. I'm a really good typist, Brian. I, I never got that good at the piano. <laughs> but, but I did do some professional dance, so that played fade off. But anyway, so um, I auditioned when I was a senior in high school in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara High. Mm -hmm. I auditioned for the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Right. It had always been my dream to work in London. And I'm going to be honest and tell you it's because I was obsessed from early, early childhood with both Julie Andrews no. <laughs> and Queen Elizabeth. No. I just wanted to be in England. And um, I never really thought about the reality of how small my chances were of getting into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And um, my, my dad did help coach me on the audition. Um, we were required to do, as I believe you still are in today's world, one classical and one contemporary monologue. And um, tell me the coaching, was it? The coaching firm, was very, or? it was firm. It was firm. Encouraging and firm? Or? You know, it was terrifying. And I'll just be frank, but what's good about that is that no professional audition ever after in my life could have been as terrifying as rehearsing for my father. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> There's right? a lot to be said for that. Right? Now, <laughs> you said you didn't know if this was true. I had heard that you were the first American admitted that to That is me. not true. Not I don't true. know how that really, that, that rumor came about. It was, I may have I was started it. Oh, really? No. I, um, <laughs> it was actually on the internet for a while, but I think it's been, it's been deleted. I was the only American in my term at RADA, which right. is maybe that was how it was generated. So RADA, and I'm not sure if this is still the case, but back then um, there were only 21 students per term and a term uh, oh. meaning um, they would sort of graduate students every half year, I think, as I recall. So it was a very small group of students in the acting program um, and they deliberately accepted twice as many boys as girls to reflect somewhat more proportionally the amount of work that would be available. Right. So there were seven girls and 14, 14 guys. Good math. I'm, I, it's OCD. <laughs> I can't shut it off. <laughs> nothing i got to work on. But and, uh, let me ask you, before that, weren't you on Broadway as a, as a youngster? Is that not true with the, with the legendary actress? Who was the one that they filmed it, but they couldn't film it because she had the choice of... Oh, you're talking about a little bit later. That's when I came back Oh, that back was later. For some reason, yes. I thought it was your child. Yeah, Claudette okay. Colbert. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, I like Claudette the fact Colbert. that you think I was a child. Oh. I was 25 when I worked with Claudette oh, Colbert, and I... she was in her 80s. Right. Yeah, so when I do talk about having worked with Claudette Colbert and Rex Harrison people, yeah. you might think I was a child. I just, for <laughs> some reason, I thought you were literally a child. I like not, that. Not, that. Well, that's how I think of you. I like it. <laughs> so my dad helped coach me for that audition, and... Amazingly. I mean, looking back, I have no idea how I was honestly accepted. It was just a, a Q crop. Well, it was principal of Rada at the time, saw something in me. And, um, and my dad had coached my contemporary audition, which was from a play called And Miss Reardon Drinks a Little. Mm -hmm. And my dad told me that it might be a wise choice, <laughs> those words, choice, choice, to, um, and I don't even remember why, I have no memory of the justification for this, but he had me wear a wig <laughs> for that. So I can remember after I did my Juliet Gallop Pace speech, I turned around with my back facing to the judges, put on my little old lady wig, <laughs> And right. Ben did the gallop. Of, I mean, sorry, Ben did the uh, and Miss Reardon drinks a little. Was this uh, a Stella Adler type thing with doing the socioeconomic, you know, character of the times? I have, would have been I, I wish I could tell you. I have no memory of that. But Hugh Crevel <sighs> later told me That's what that he, he got thought it. it was so brave. <laughs> I'm not sure he thought it was good, but he thought it was really brave. 
Wow. So I was accepted as the only American in that year. But there were other, of course, other Americans. As a matter of fact, you know who was another American who went to RADA before my time was Sigourney Weaver's mother. Really? Oh, Sigourney Weaver. And I, and I know this because she invited me to her home in Montecito when it was in the local news that I had been accepted to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and proudly showed me a picture of her daughter, Sigourney, who was just entering Hollywood and who was just about to be cast in a in a, this movie called Alien. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, fantastic. I'd like to know her. And she sat me down for a beautiful dinner that she cooked herself and told me about her days at RADA. In, um, but she was actually, wait a second, Sigourney Weaver's mother was English. But she wanted to tell me about her RADA days. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Yes. But so you are the first other, American. Well, just, there are other Americans. I'm putting there it on. Were, it's uh, confusing, too, because Americans make up a large proportion of the summer programs at RADA. Right. Because during the actual terms of RADA, it's largely populated by students who are under scholarship because Britain has a great endorsement of the arts. Right. And so they're not making a lot of money off of the British students. So... Had you studied here at all before you went to Rome? Only under my father, who Only. did teach an acting class in Santa Barbara. And he was doing it out of Uta Hagen's book at that time? He, he, he was a big fan of Uta Hagen. Right. And so, yes, he would use that as somewhat of a guide. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is that that got me in my head like crazy. I, I, it was just me. It just yeah. me. It made me feel like I wasn't ever authentically acting if I didn't do extensive background notes on the character. Right. To do everything to do with every little manner of speech and, and physiology down to the way they're thinking and what motivates them and everything they do. If I hadn't done notebooks of background material, I wasn't good. Right. So I, it took me a long time to get. So then you went to RADA and started with the voice and the movement. And so the... RADA at that time didn't really teach acting acting. It, oh. taught, it taught a lot of movement, voice production, dialect work, which mm -hmm. came to be very useful for me. You know, restoration, comedy, uh, uh, Moliere, of course, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, right. Shakespeare, right. interpretation. Okay, so I was just going to say yes, that. With yes, Shakespeare, yes, they, they yes. had a... Oh, for sure. Yes, how to how to study Shakespeare, how to portray Shakespeare, how to make it real, but no real acting acting. Okay. We did have a Juilliard teacher who was American who would come over once a term to talk to us a little bit about a more American approach to mm -hmm. acting. She was wonderful, and I wish I could remember her name. Terrible of me that I cannot. Um, and so that was a little bit of sort of acting, but but. It's a joke among, amongst us who were there in that era that we really didn't study acting, acting, but it was an amazing life experience. And many of the British students graduated to go on to be in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Right. Do you think that, that really getting into script analysis about Shakespeare would bring up enough in you to be able to act emotionally with those it seems to me counterproductive or not counter whatever I'm trying to say that, you know, both sides of it because they seem to be, uh, they didn't seem to, they were so technical at that time, probably before your time, but mm -hmm. it was a real technical approach. But it just seems to me with the limited amount mm -hmm. of uh, script analysis I've done with Shakespeare, it's, I just find it just really beautiful to, to everything that they're, they're bringing up. It almost seems like you would inherently know the emotion from it if you broke it down, right? That's a really smart approach. Um, the the s text can be overwhelming if you haven't studied sure. it at all. So there is that value in, in understanding that the iambic pentameter really is there to serve a purpose of what the um, the truth of what you're saying does need to emphasize. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, it is very easy to let that overtake you. And um, it, remember that back then, wh when I was at RADA, we were required to speak in what was then known as standard English mm -hmm. accents. So I had to learn how to eradicate my American accent, which right. was very useful to me later in life. But we all, no matter what region of, the, of Britain the students came from, whether they were from Australia or New Zealand or Canada, we all had to speak with the same standard English accent. We had to pass a test mm -hmm. to do that. And 
and many of the students who came from British regional areas didn't pass the test because they didn't think they needed to, but they brought it was super strict about it. And I was very proud to have gotten a clear pass. Right. So I tell you that story in order to say that was sort of why you also needed to uh, um, uh, come at the script from a certain angle. It was an old school approach of iambic pentameter being really an important thing to study right. before you could understand what Shakespeare was meaning to right. portray. Right. But as you and I came to learn in our acting life, it's not the best way to come at truth. No, no. The way we learned, I mean, the, the foundation is, is um, irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. the, found, the Meisner Foundation mm -hmm. uh, done the right way. Yeah. And rehearsed and really ingrained yeah. the right way. But not everything can be done just emotionally. I'm not saying you're yeah. saying that. Yeah, I just yeah, whenever yeah, I hear yeah, that yeah. and I go back. Shit. She got loose. <laughs> so that goes back to my audition for the kidnapping uh, pedophile. Yes, uh, yes. So I, going back to Bobby Lewis, we don't need to do that right now. <laughs> But I just love Bobby Lewis. It's always good to circle back I, to I, Bobby Lewis. I, I mention him quite often. So that was a two-year program? It was at the time a three-year program. Oh, okay. And then when it was time for me to leave, because I was there on a student visa, my um, then boyfriend and I at the time decided that we would get married because we loved each other and it was going to last forever. And well, what the heck, that way I could stay in the country. We had very dreamlike ideals about how perfect that was going to be. Right. And I'm happy to tell you that we did stay friends and and uh, and he has has gone on to a great career. His name is Robert Dawes. He's a great British actor and writer. Okay. And we stayed friends and yeah, that marriage did not last. Here's the ironic thing. I wanted so much to be an English actress. Right that I refused to even speak with my American accent in my real life because I, I, I wanted to audition for the Royal Shakespeare Company. I wanted to be that. Whereas if I had simply been an American in England with my now ability to work there because I married an English right. actor, I would have been a much of yes, greater sir. interest. Yes. And the few jobs that I did get in regional theater, and I did one BBC series, were as Americans. And still, I somehow just couldn't embrace my Americanism. <laughs> I had a huge identity crisis and told sweet Bob that I needed to come back to the United States and find myself. And he was very sad but understanding. And what can I say? There, there. I came back, spent some time in L.A. trying to figure out what that scene was about, wasn't getting anywhere. Then I moved to New York. So now we're talking about right. early 80s when I moved to New York. Right. Yeah. And that's when you worked with Claudette Colbert? And I worked with Claudette Colbert and Rex Harrison on a wonderful um, Broadway uh, tour called uh, two, uh, two Into One. No, sorry, that was the one I did with Tony Randall. Wow. Aren't We All. Yeah. So Aren't We All with Rex Harrison and Claudette Colbert. Did a lot of soap opera work at that time, too. I did a few things. I did an American Masters series um, uh, episode and and then I went on tour with Two Into One with Tony Randall. And that was just before he started the National Actors Theater. Oh, loved, really? Loved, loved, loved working with Tony Randall. What a great. Yeah, my dad was friends with him. Oh. I mean, you know, my dad was there the same, must have been the same time your father was there doing live TV in the 50s, yeah, I, late 40s. And my yeah. dad was there late 40s and then into the 50s, into uh, probably about 57 or 58. So they must have crossed crossed yeah. paths, Brian. We, yeah, I mean, they must have. The things you don't can't ask your parents now that yeah. they're gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. he had a lot of those, a lot of friends. But I told you the the story when he was he, he was up for Slade and uh, the Ice Man cometh, oh. and Jose Quintero uh, said to him, Bill, if I give you this part. You can't do radio and TV during the day. And my dad said, but that's what I do. That's right. And that's how my father talked. <laughs> but that's what I do, Jose. He goes, Bill, no, I'm telling you, if I give you this part, you can't do radio and TV during the day. But that's how I make my living. Bill? So I'm not saying he had the part, but he was told he was three blessed. times that if I give you this part, you can't do that. And he just couldn't do No, my dad was an ass. <laughs> my dad was an ass. He got the part of the detective 
of the first traveling company to leave Broadway of Guys and Dolls. Is that right? Yeah. And his agent called him, and my dad said, I just got an apartment in Manhattan. Do you know how difficult that is? Oh, my goodness. Wow. And he did not take it. Wow. That is my father. Wow. I just got an apartment in there. Do not. <laughs> my dad was always say to me, Brian, when you're acting, only do what you do best. That was for you, Sherry. Sherry loved it when my dad said that. So I got a... Whoa, my son texted me. Scott likes me to leave this on in case it rings and I take calls. I've done it with Sherry before. You know how funny Sherry can be. Yes. So then you came back to Los Angeles. How? So after spending several years, you know, doing that sort of thing in New York, I just I got an agent manager who thought I should start auditioning for pilot season stuff. Mm -hmm. So I started going back and forth during pilot season. Right. By that time, I was married for the second time. Right. And then, frankly, that back and forth thing broke up that marriage. <laughs> oh. And got a couple really good TV things and figured that was what I needed to do was move fully back to L.A. And um, fast forward, I met uh, my third husband and father of my children. And that was about the time you and I met. Right. Because I started attending yeah, that is when we Playhouse were. West. Yeah. Because I actually decided I need to, needed to relearn how to act. Because yeah. I wasn't getting the, some of the jobs that I thought I, I, I could be getting. And I realized I, I had a lot, a lot more to learn. Right. We always have a lot more to learn. So it was a really important, humbling experience for me to start from scratch at Playhouse West. Mm -hmm. To be, you know, in a class with Robert Carnegie and to th toss aside everything I'd ever learned, mm -hmm. as he told me how fake I was, and I needed to hear that. And uh, it was revolutionary. It was eye-opening. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, the, then I went on to become a teacher there later. I right. became such a believer in it. Right. Yeah, and it was good. And yeah. you're a good, good teacher with your compassionate and understanding, and, and you have uh, experience, knowledge, firsthand experience, life experience. Mm -hmm. So you were good at that. And then you did a play called the... Uh... Called The Baby Dance with you. That was a fantastic experience. That was a great acting experience of my life. I, so I consider it mine too. Yeah. So the way that happened was Alison Bibikoff brought me the play. And she wanted me to play the Jewish husband in a scene. And this is, this is what taught me everything about acting. I took that play home and read it. Look, I, I was born in Hollywood... I grew up in Los Angeles. My parents were from the Bronx, and my dad was from Massachusetts, an Irish settlement, and then moved to New York for many years to act. So he was in Midtown East. I read that redneck part, and I just said, I, I can't, I'm not going to do that scene with you, but I could play the shit out of this redneck. So we got people together. We met at your apartment. Kevin Wright was absolutely perfect for the part, and he... I, I don't know what he was doing at that first read. I don't know what he was doing at that first read. I don't know if you remember, he was doing, he was doing this. Yeah, yeah. when you're doing the scene with the husband and, and the wife, and he's like, and I said, wait a minute, this is what this guy is. He really is a businessman. He was in and worked for one of the big stock companies, you know, yeah. one of the big, I mean, it's who he was. He yeah, had yeah, short yeah. legs. Yeah. <laughs> he has the description of the uh, character, and he was perfect for this. And he, he couldn't get out of his own way. So Kenny Moscow took over, who was phenomenal. Kenny's Absolutely a great actor. Phenomenal. Also short in stature and sat the part. And then, and then Brett stood in one time in the play. You know, and they were talking about his little legs. And Brett is nothing but legs. <laughs> but I wanted Steve Davis. I don't know if you remember Steve, tall. Yeah. Uh, he had played college uh, football, six foot four, African-American gentleman. And I just said, why don't we have him as the attorney? And then when he shows up in that scene, because I'm just, you know, for those who don't know, I'm just a straight trailer trash redneck racist. I mean, it's just, that's just what it was. And I say, then he shows up, and I'm like, this is the guy that's been running my life right here, and he's black, you know, and, I, and Tony said, no, only, uh, only Scott Tropes could play that part. Bob says, because he really is an attorney. I go, okay, who shows up to play the part? Tony. Tony. Which is good because he's removed from his feelings. <laughs> so, and then Lola Stone, who oh. I, miss, I miss dearly, who was phenomenal. 
Yeah, she really was extraordinary. She was phenomenal, and she played my wife, and I can't tell you how many dozens of T-shirts were ripped by you pulling them off my back. And, I was, <laughs> and that was before the play. Ah. And, uh, yeah, and uh, when I'm actually beating up Lola, who then did, not beating her up, obviously I'm smacking yeah, her around. Yeah, it was yeah. stage, she would put an arm up, and I would slap her. The audience couldn't see it, and I'd slap her really hard in the arm, but they would just hear the noise and yep, yep. see the head. And yep, so, yep. in this day and age. Yep, yep, yep. Do you remember the rehearsal at our house when the landscaper from next door came yes, over? I do, now you mention it. Yeah, so wow. I'm knocking around my pregnant wife, and uh, Pamela's in the scene, and uh, Lola was my wife, and I'm... I'm saying, in my house, I'm screaming, talk like that to me in my house, and I'm smacking her, and there's a knock. I go to the door, and he's like, why don't you just walk away? <laughs> and I'm like, what? Why don't you just walk away? You've been watching Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. Now I want to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, and that's teaching acting. So I co-founded Lola's Acting School with my son, Kyle Lally, Lally or Lally Acting School. I've been acting for a, a long time now, of 100 plus credits on IMDb, hundreds of plays I've been involved with over the years. And I just want to share that experience with you. What we do differently here at Lola's is we give you practical advice that you can use on a movie set, on a play, an audition, anywhere. We give you the foundation to build yourself as a great actor. If you come to us, you don't know anything. We can teach you everything you need to know to be comfortable on a, on a set and to excel. Don't just listen to me. Look at what our students are doing. Daryl Wesley, who is writing on two hit shows, The Game and The Upshaws, and Ben Barrett, who is a series regular on The Politician. Megan Davis, who is uh, playing Amber Heard in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard story. Come check us out. We're at the Historic Arc Theater in the NoHo Arts District. You ever want to try plant-based eating? I have. What, you're a little confused, overwhelmed, you don't know how to get started? Definitely. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Go to Debbie Chu's Chew On Vegan YouTube channel. Debbie Chu is a plant-based RN. I've known Debbie for over 38 years, and she's very good at what she does. You go to the channel, and there's 300, over 300 recipes. They're simple, easy to make, and they're delicious. If you want to try it, you just might get healthy. Give it a shot. Chew On Vegan. You go, oh, oh, buddy, we're rehearsing a play. He's like, let me see it. <laughs> so we walk in, and I pick up the, the play, and it says, Al hits Wanda. He goes, oh, my God. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I was like, buddy, you got all the balls in the world. If you went up to someone's house, they could shoot you. But he really stood up for the ladies. But that was great. But that was, that was an amazing amazing experience and it your really father was. came and i get My to meet him and came. talk to him about acting and he did that thing with me at samuel french and and i got that's one of the one of the only plays i got acting work out of the people came and put me in movies and stuff so I'm that was surprised. Uh, yeah was, i'm not surprised that you got work from that it was great yeah. so i guess we just <laughs> we don't have to talk about career and chives that was a big part of oh. life but which was unfortunate because your husband was my partner. We had a split, which happens in business. It just we had a split. You guys moved to Santa Barbara, but I lost touch with you, and it was really heartbreaking because we've been attached at the artistic hip yeah. since we've known each other. So yeah. and always been like that, and yeah. um, always wonderful to see you. But we um, we saw each other again when uh, David passed away. Oh, yes, who was the uh, another partner in the business. Right. Oh, he so passed yes. away in my office on my birthday. I didn't know that. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know it was your Sherry birthday. was really mad at me. I walked in and said, hey, happy birthday to me. Oh, I didn't realize uh, that. Oh. I know. Lakeman. His, Lakeman. Yeah. Yes. And his wife was such a close. Suzanne. Susan. Suzanne. Yeah, she Suzanne, also Susan. has passed away. Oh, how, has she? She passed away eight years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. Yeah. Was it the alcohol? Yes. Yes. And that's, that's exactly why he. Right. That's why he passed. He had hepatitis C or something and refused to stop yeah. drinking. Then he just bled out in the office. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, that was tough. So you guys 
left and started a, um, a Korean chives type business in Santa Barbara. Brett, Brett did Brett, yeah. and ended up selling it after a year. And then he went into restaurant delivery software um, and did that for, for a while. So I yeah. want to talk about, you know, comes for a circle to this. Frankie, your daughter. Well, Brett and I uh, split. I'm now married again, and uh, and that has all worked out well. And uh, our daughter that uh, that Brett and I had together is a dancer in New York. Um, she she goes to the King's College, and she is also interning at the UN because she's also interested in politics and economics. So she's dividing her time between dance and a potential career and something to do with ambassadorship? We shall see. My father lived on 50th between 1st and 2nd. I don't think you it see, was two so blocks from the UN. Huh? There's so many alignments. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm very uh, proud of her. She's a well, really, really Yeah, good. but I've seen some of her her videos you posted. She's so an amazing she's, she artist. She is a really remarkable artist because, well, she she's a natural actor in what she does. She, she doesn't just move her body. She feels the story in a way that is deeply moving to watch. She's just a natural in that way. Yeah. Thank you for acknowledging that. And then we have two boys who are still in high school, and they're athletes. and uh, Being recruited already. For volleyball, yeah. So we shall see, we shall see. But, but, but back when I was first with Brett, and we were still living in Los Angeles before we moved up to Santa Barbara, back in my own hometown, well, sort of hometown, I had started listening to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And that was in the l mid to late 80s, back when audiobooks were first, um, you know, being distributed. And my dad had done some recording for the blind, you know, way back, that was really what audiobooks were. And I literally know the story of the inception of audiobooks from the guy who, at Random House, who really was one of the original partners with Books on Tape. Mm -hmm. And it started as a business that business com commuters um, would, would, would read for each other on cassette tapes because it was something to do while they were stuck in LA traffic. They would listen to each other reading the book that they had always wanted to read and never had time to actually sit down and read. And then one of them realized that this was a great business and it was off and running. So back in the early days of recorded books, I thought, well, I actually think that I might be good at that. I love books. I'm very um, interested in all things to do with the literary world. Um, and I have acting training that might be of, of some use in this realm. So I went back to New York to start auditioning for the publishers because back then it, it was really primarily all the, all the stuff was being recorded in New York in the professional audiobook world. And started doing that um, very successfully until I became pregnant with Frankie, and then I put everything on hold. Oh, I didn't to realize you started it back then. Yeah, but I put everything on hold because I, it, I, I, being uh, being a mom absolutely was the greatest joy and fulfillment yeah. of my life, and I put everything on hold for the years that I was really solely raising my kids, mm -hmm. and so I only got back into it a few years ago. And now the audiobook world has exploded with every book that is published in hard copy. There's a concurrent audio right, edition. Right. And it's a very, very competitive field for narrators, which is both good and, and bad. It's good because there's so much opportunity, mm -hmm. um, but you have to promote yourself as your own small business. It's not like the on-camera acting world where you have agents and managers representing you. You 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 don't. There, there's not enough... Frankly, there, there are no residuals. They're all buyouts. Mm. Um, they're per job employments. So you are your own small business. Um, most of it is now under union jurisdiction, but in the beginning, that was not even the case. Wow. Yeah. So this is what this series that Brian Lally, Hollywood native, is about, I think, is finding out how you've carried your art yeah. to, to where you are today how everybody is still being an artist yeah. because I remember someone once asked Sherry years ago when we were married, they said, how long is Brian going to act? And she looked at him and said, well, he's always going to act. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. 
which is what you're doing. When we had lunch that day, you told me about the, the characters that you had to do to really involve to immerse yourself in the different characters because you're the only one reading the book. Yeah. Did you ever study strict character work? You know, back in the old days, or is this yeah, something? Yeah, back in the old days, I did. That was actually part part of my dad's training. My okay. dad, from his actor's studio days, character work was huge. Sure. I only looked at it differently when I came to Playhouse West and saw that, you know, characterizations are best added after you found the truth in your own, you know, your own self right. and that you can add those layers if you really are are working from truth first but i knew how to do character work right. and i knew how to do dialects from my work at rada which yeah. comes in handy although dialects aren't everything in the audiobook world because you can do a wide range of expressions with the characters through just simply tone of voice and intention it doesn't have to be all dialect that's a bit of a a path you, that is, is overused. Did your dad ever talk about animal exercises? Oh, for sure. We did oh, okay. all of it. We did all the sense memories, all, all the the different ways you could approach a character, everything from a picture, from, you know... A picture exercise, or, yeah. Or something sensory, like, you know, chewing tinfoil will make you e. twitch. And yeah. That you could use that. <laughs> we did all of that back when I was in high school, yeah. Okay. But bringing it all together in the audiobook world is interesting because when I was first recording audiobooks back before I took my break to raise my kids, audiobooks back then were were not um, as character driven. Even if you were sure. recording a book that had a lot of characters in it, a big historical fiction piece, it was still the trend in the audiobook world more so at that time to read it pretty much with straight narration and, right. and only do a little bit of a nod here and there towards the differentiation so that the listeners wouldn't get lost. But if you listen to recordings from that era, you won't hear a lot of enormous character work right. from the narrator. Right. Today, that has changed. You know, it's the, it's the case with acting in general. Things evolve, and in the audiobook world today, there are whole courses in colleges on how to become an audiobook narrator. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, I have it's, no idea. Yeah. And one of the things you study is is the character approach. And so, yeah, audiobook narrators in today's world are, are very much expected to be able to, without an without being intrusive, without being too, of course, performative, because you don't want the listener to be aware of the narrator. You want the listener to be immersed in the in the characters you are portraying. Right. So it's a subtle thing, but you're not working off anybody else. You're right. all in your... Right. It's a very specific skill, but you, right. are, you do need to do that. And what's more, then there is the narrator voice itself, which which is a whole nother aspect to this approach because yes, it's neutral, but it's also um, a part of the, uh, if, if you're doing character voices, the, the he said, she said, those between, you know, uh, things are, are, are colored by the, the, the character that you're currently portraying. Right. So that it's part of it. It's really a fascinating study. Yeah, it's amazing. A couple things I want to mention. I guess we can go back and forth cutting stuff. I, I thought about it early on. Was your dad still affiliated with Fox when he did the Planet of the Apes movie, Escape from the Planet of the Apes? Was that how he that got was, it? He was no longer under contract right. because that was after the fall of the contract right. system. So he was no yeah, no longer under contract. But right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he just happened to be a Fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Clint Eastwood was always at Warner Brothers? Is that where... I don't know the answer to that. He was there for Mount Piso, was there for a long yeah. time. I forgot about this, so... When your dad and Susie Parker moved to New York, did she study at the actor's studio? So Susie had wanted to act. Right. And Oh, but she stopped. When well, here's the thing. She, she was a brilliant model. Right. One can argue that models are simply images that the photographer makes. I got a story when you're done. All right. It's a favorite story of mine. All right. Yeah. 
Well, I'll only say that models are artists, too. They're collaborative with the photographer, but a model who just stands there is not really using the... I mean, the, 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 it's not a great model. Mm -hmm. Susie was a great model. Right. When that camera was on her, she inhabited the scenario that they were creating together collaboratively in mm -hmm. such a way that the images are moving to see. They really are. Mm -hmm. Frustratingly, when the moving camera was on her, she became self-aware, whereas she was not at all when it was the still camera. Oh. I watched her. This would have been, of course, towards the end of her modeling career, but I watched her in photo sessions when the camera was clicking. I, well, I was privileged to watch Avedon photograph her. The camera never stopped clicking, and every shot was different. She wouldn't just stand there and wait for a dozen clicks. Mm. She would fill every frame, every click with something different. It was fabulous. But when the moving camera was on her, she just got in her head and froze. And you can see that. She was very hard on herself, so I'm not saying something that she didn't acknowledge herself. She never was proud of any of her acting work. Um, she thought that she was stiff. And she was so much of a perfectionist in everything she did in life that she didn't want to do it anymore if she couldn't be the actress she wanted to be. So she yeah. quit after just a few movies. She was proud of the movie she did with Gary Cooper called 10 North Frederick. Okay. Um, but the movie where she met my dad called Circle of Deception, she thought she was awful in. She was beautiful to look at. Right. Uh, Dad's very, very good in that movie. Um, Anyway, so she quit acting. She did study a little bit, but um, and I'm not sure whether she studied at the actor's studio. Knowing Susie, probably not, because mm -hmm. she wouldn't have wanted to be competitive with Dad, and she wouldn't have wanted to do it her way. But she was very stubborn, very prideful, and just didn't want to do it if she wasn't going to be great at it. Yeah. Well, funny thing bringing up Gary Cooper, because we think about way back then... Um, you know, being technically technical and stiff, and a lot of them were. You know, there was some naturals, as we talked about. But Gary Cooper, I read a quote from him. He said, if I can think how this person thinks, then I don't have to act. This is like in the 30s. This is very early on. I don't think that he got that from anywhere except from someone who is exceptionally talented in a way because he was the biggest movie star in the world for a That's while. For sure. And uh, yeah, he got that. I, you were going to say something about. I, I was. That's where I was going to when I said yes. he got that. Instead of saying he figured that out, I was. I was going through a few different thoughts at the time. Uh -huh. So. No, you were going to tell a model. A I sure modeling was. Story. I was going to tell a modeling story about Lucille Ball, when she uh, got kicked out of acting class, and they wrote her mother a letter and said, "You're wasting your money." And I just love these stories yeah. about people who want to do something. And they just overcome the odds, you know, of telling her parents. She, she's no good. She's, I think Betty Davis might have been in her class at that time wow. or something. And she was fired as a Zigfield girl. And she said she was going to be a model. And this is on a talk show. And Carol Burnett is sitting there, a very young Carol Burnett, who Lucy happened to like. And obviously idolized Lucille Ball. And she said, I just said I was going to be the best model there was. And I told that, I was driving Uber years ago, and I told that to a young girl who said she was a model. She was related, I don't, I don't know if I want to bring, she was related to a sitcom star, very beautiful woman. And I had picked her up at, at the star's house. And she said, well, you know, there's really nothing to modeling. Ah. Oh. Right. And I said, well, Lucille Ball <laughs> became the most powerful woman in Hollywood. Yeah. At one time, and have you seen the documentaries or being the Ricardos? I any need of that? to, but oh I have not. Oh my God, she yet. Did, just what they did—they owned three movie studios yeah. at one time. I mean, for Christ's sake, yeah. you know, this is a woman who was told she couldn't do anything, yeah. and then she owned three studios and created so many TV shows, or executive produced, and you know, obviously they financed, um, you know, the original Star Trek. You know what I mean? They were involved in so many things, and that's why I just said to this young girl, I said, well, um, you know, maybe you should research some people because she was going to get into acting, and she'd already thought that 
modeling. And, and this is, you know, this is not, you know, get off my lawn. Maybe it is get off my lawn, but it's, but it's, you know, being this age and being in this uh, business for a long time and still studying acting and still caring about acting to hear these young people, you're trying to encourage them to work, you know, focus. I don't say work hard anymore. I say focus. And that's something I learned because work hard seems to put so, put, put a negative connotation on it. Because if you're always focused on it, you're going to work. Yeah. You're going to work all the time. If you're always focused, you're going to keep working on it. And so when I try to tell these young people that that's how it goes, I just I just look at Lucy. I just look at these stories. I, I just hear you talk about Susie. Why, why did she become world famous? Because obviously there's a, there's a billion beautiful women out there. Why is she better than everybody else? I had no idea until you just told me, and it just reminded me of Lucy. said, I don't know what she did, but she ended up making a, you know quite a living and then getting a, as a contract player and becoming... You know, Lucille Ball. I love Lucy. So what I love most when teaching is to see the light go on in young people. Yeah. yeah. To see it on stage when they first say, oh. And I say to them when I'm teaching and they're arguing, uh, which I don't let happen much, but I say, you're ignorant to the fact of what we do until you do it. Mm. And then you know. You do, and you have, to, you have to keep that knowledge in your own head and heart because, well... Similarly to what you were saying about Lucille Ball, when Susie worked with Fred Astaire, he told her that when he was first screen testing, the literal response from the producers that you can see, this is, I think, quite a famous story, but you can see handwritten notes that say about him, can't act, can't sing, can dance a little. <laughs> Fred Astaire. Nobody worked harder than him. A friend of mine, Jim Roop, Jim Roop's father worked for MGM, and one of his jobs was to, on the weekends, to sit on the soundstage with a stopwatch and time Fred Astaire's rehearsals because he got paid for rehearsal. So he would sit there in a, in a folding chair, as people did back then before video games and cable, that people had a longer uh, attention span, and Fred Astaire would just be on the soundstage at MGM just spin it around and he'd be there and just clock the time so he could turn it in for the you know but that man wow. that man worked oh, focused yeah. to whatever you want to call it and he was the king of the freaking world there for yeah. a while so yeah. Yeah, great stories about people that find their way and I thank you for finding your way here to the the podcast studio do your, you. your boys have any full send uh, equipment oh my boys love the full send stuff <laughs> I how is it that I knew nothing about that until Brian Lally well, and, you know, I am, introduced I, I, me to it? But my boys knew all about it. Full send. <laughs> they love it. I did quite a few videos for full send. I brought them the Gramps character, oh, we and then the we, ex character. We, we expanded on it. I am very amused by the Gramps character. I can't believe that you are brave enough to do it. <laughs> to go out there and <laughs> and just risk people being so shocked and horrified. <laughs> well, you know what? Honestly, I didn't think I could do that sort of stuff. And then they offered me a good bit of money, and I was like, I better start doing it. But it's all acting. Once you know it's acting, yeah, yeah. and you're going out there to do a bit, even though you're pranking people and they don't know, it's uh, and, and we tell people afterwards. And 99% of people think it's fun. And they don't mind, and they they agree to be on YouTube and stuff, and it and it's great. So it, it's a, it's it a lot of fun. It doesn't look like acting at all. No. It's just well, perfection. go on, you 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 go on. <laughs> it's just you go on. true. Well, that's wonderful. I love you to pieces. Always love have. You too, Dolly. I think we're going to end it here, and um, then I want to show you my secret project. Yes, and, show me your secret project. And it's going to be on. <laughs> Anything uh, you want to. Promote while you're here, Pamela. Oh, you yeah. got a website oh, oh, oh. and social or anything? Website or? I do have a website. Um, need to update it just a tiny bit with a couple of things that I finished recently, but PamelaDillman.com. And I just finished a book I am super proud of called The Wilder Widows by Catherine Hastings. Um, she's currently writing the sequel for that. And um, yeah, check it out. It's right now on Audible. <laughs>